The book of Ezekiel, chapter 21, with a word of wisdom from our Father, in Jesus' name, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and drop thy word, that's to distill gradually toward the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, speaking to the land of Israel, the word of the Lord that came to Ezekiel, the word of the Lord being the true Christ, whose tongue is a sharp two-edged sword, as we know from the book of Revelation, but for every positive there's a negative, and the sword that comes out of Satan's mouth, the king of Babylon of the end times, is the deception, the opposite of the word of the Lord, which is the truth. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh, from the south to the north, that's the entire planet. And you know of the king of the south and the king of the north of the book of Daniel in chapter 11, speaking of Jacob and Esau, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath, it shall not return any more. In other words, Satan will never again, after the hour of temptation, be allowed to impersonate Christ. After the thousand years are finished, it's just him. His role of Antichrist and his one world system will be destroyed in the lake of fire upon the return of the true Christ, as we know from Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. Sigh, therefore, thou son of man, with the breaking of thy loins, and with bitterness sigh before their eyes, and it shall be... When they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou, that thou shalt answer, For the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, every mind shall melt, the contents of the mind, that is to say, any truth that may have been in their mind will dissipate because of the deception. This is what Christ spoke of in Matthew 13, ultimately, in verse 19, where he said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, ultimately at the sixth trumpet, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, his mind, that is to say. He catcheth it away. And people being deceived now through the hidden dynasty of religion that they're going to be caught away before the tribulation of Satan are already set up to worship the devil. Whenever he appears at the sixth trumpet, they're going to think that he's Jesus. Every heart shall melt and all hands shall be feeble. They'll receive that mark of the beast in their right hand, meaning they'll take orders from Satan, thinking him to be Christ. And every spirit shall faint being killed spiritually by the sword of the king of Babylon, the tongue of the false Christ, the deception, and all knees shall be weak as water, whereby they bow to the false Christ, as opposed to standing against him, as God's elect shall do, as we know from Ephesians chapter 6, they will stand against Satan and his one world system with the gospel armor on and in place, not bowing a knee to Baal, the image of Baal, that is to say the false Christ. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Say, A sword, a sword, is sharpened, and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished, that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? It contemneth the rod of my son, as every tree. It despises the scepter of Judah, the sword of the king of Babylon does. Historically, Judah would not listen to the voice of the Lord our God. And so it is to this day, obviously, the Christians of the world do not hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord their God for the most part. They're biblically illiterate. And that's why they'll be deceived at the sixth trumpet. And notice it says it despises every tree, trees being symbolic of people in our Father's word. And we know from the book of Revelation that at the sixth trumpet, a third part of the trees were burnt up. That's written of in the first trumpet, but that looks forward to the sixth trumpet whenever that third dies spiritually. A third of the world are Christian as it stands, but they'll no longer be Christians at the sixth trumpet whenever they begin to worship the devil, leaving only those with the seal of God in their forehead. 
and he hath given it to be furbished that it may be handled. The sword is sharpened, and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. That's the false Christ. He's only allowed to do what God allows him to do. He can't go outside those boundaries. As we know from the book of Job, Satan has to have permission from God. And as it's written in Revelation chapter 9 concerning Satan and his locust army, they can only hurt those who have not the seal of God in their forehead. Cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people, it shall be upon the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people, smite therefore on thy thigh. Because it is a trial, it's the hour of temptation. And what if the sword contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord. And at the seventh trumpet, whenever the true Christ returns to rule with the rod of iron... Babylon, that is to say confusion, shall be no more, with Satan locked up in the bottomless pit for the thousand years, unable to deceive the nations during that thousand year period, being let loose afterwards, and then whoever follows him then will be blotted out in the lake of fire. Everyone else who stands against him, who loves our Heavenly Father, will go into the eternity, the third world age. Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy, and smite thine hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time. What's two times three? It's six. Satan appears at the sixth trumpet. The sword of the slain, it is the sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth into their privy chambers. Remember the secret chambers Christ spoke of in Matthew chapter 24. If they say Christ is in the secret chambers, believe it not. If they say, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Christ will not return until immediately after the hour of temptation. And you won't need someone to tell you about it because you'll be changed into a spiritual body instantly at that time, along with all flesh. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that their heart may faint, and their ruins be multiplied. Ah, it is made bright, it is wrapped up for the slaughter, it is sharpened for the slaughter, being better translated. Go thee one way or the other, and this is God speaking to Nebuchadnezzar historically, to the false Christ in the futurist sense, and that may sound strange, but who's in control of everything? And there you have your answer. Go thee one way or other, either on the right hand or on the left, whithersoever thy face is set. I will also smite mine hands together, God says, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. And rest is what Sabbath means. Christ became our Sabbath, and the true Christ will return at the seventh trumpet. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, the true Christ being the word of the Lord, also thou son of man, appoint thee two ways that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. Babylon means confusion, and this sword is the opposite of the sword that comes out of the mouth of the true Christ, which is the truth. It's speaking of the tongue of the false Christ, which is the deception. Both twain shall come forth out of one land, and choose thou a place, choose it, at the head of the way to the city, Jerusalem, that is to say, appoint a way that the sword may come to Rabath of the Ammonites and to Judah in Jerusalem the defensed. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way. And if you wanted to properly translate Revelation 13.1, it shouldn't really say, I stood upon the sand of the sea and then I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. As you can see in Revelation 12.17, if you have a companion Bible, it's really supposed to say, he stood upon the sand of the sea. The dragon stood upon the sand of the sea, and then I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. In other words, when Satan is cast out along with his angels, that first beast, the political beast, rises up out of the sea, which is symbolic of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And after the deadly wound, which is by a sword, Satan shall appear as the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. So that's the two ways we're talking about here as far as the futurist sense of this is concerned. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way, at the head of the two ways to use divination, he made his arrows bright, he consulted with images, he looked in the liver. 
And this was the religious practice of Nebuchadnezzar. They worshipped other gods. They didn't worship our father. And as we know from Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a group of soothsayers who would interpret dreams for him. But they couldn't interpret the dream that he had about that image. God, through Daniel, interpreted that dream. And we find out there that it concerned the latter days. And it's symbolic even of Satan's one world system during that hour of temptation. And it parallels Daniel chapter 7, which speaks of the four parts of that one world system. The fourth part of it being strictly supernatural, made up of Satan and his angels. Daniel's fourth beast is exclusively supernatural. The other three parts of it are the lion, which is symbolic of the Christian nations, the bear, which is symbolic of Esau, as well as the non-Christian nations, the alliance you can read of in Ezekiel 38 and 39 even, and the Kenites, that leopard that has four heads, symbolic of the Kenites and their four hidden dynasties of education, economics, politics, and religion. All four of these rise up together at the same time at the woe of the fifth trumpet at the beginning of the five-month-long hour of temptation. At his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem, which is where Satan shall appear in the middle of that five-month-long hour of temptation to appoint captains to open the mouth in the slaughter. He'll open his mouth in blasphemy against God, as it's written in Revelation, to lift up the voice with shouting to appoint battering rams against the gates to cast a mount and to build a fort. And it shall be unto them as a false divination, because it's the false Christ in their sight. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, leave Judea, as Christ said in Mark 13, to them that have sworn oaths, but he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. One shall be taken and the other left. One shall be taken by Antichrist and the other listened to the true Christ. And whenever he heard that Christ had returned, he didn't believe it. As we were ordered, he hearkened unto the voice of the true Christ, in other words. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings your sins do appear, because I say that ye are come to remembrance, ye shall be taken with the hand. One shall be taken and the other left. One shall be taken in the deception. The one that was left had the seal of God in their forehead, the truth of God's word in their mind, because they cared enough to study the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Those that are deceived cease to be Christians when they begin to worship Antichrist, and it is only the true Christ who can erase your sins upon your repentance, upon your confession to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are erased if you're sincere. So that's what it means by your transgressions being discovered and that in all your doings your sins do appear. They're not erased from that point on because you're no longer a Christian if you worship the false Christ. And thou, profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. Zedekiah will no longer be the king of Judah, and in the futurist sense, this concerns the king of the south, the occupant of the throne of David during the five-month period. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. And you can see this in greater detail in the future ascents in Daniel chapter 11, verses 21 through 30. There you have the first half hour, the first two and a half months of the hour of temptation. That concerns the political beast, and then it's wounded to death. And this word profane here, where it says, And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, believe it or not, this word profane, if you look it up in your Strong's Concordance, means deadly wounded. So there you have it. That's when those three Christian nations, Judah, Ephraim, and Manasseh, which symbolizes all of Christianity, are plucked up by the roots because they'll begin to worship the false Christ. And historically, Zedekiah's sons were killed and his eyes were put out. So see the spiritual meaning within that. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. As it's written in Genesis chapter 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come, until the true Christ returns. And it was overturned historically whenever Nebuchadnezzar, 
burn Jerusalem. So that was the first overturning, going from Jerusalem to Ireland, because Jeremiah and Baruch took Zedekiah's daughters to Ireland, and the scepter of Judah continued from there. Then it was overturned again when it went from Ireland to Scotland, and then again when it went from Scotland to England. And then, at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial, that is to say, it shall be no more, until he come whose right it is, at the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, and within the time frame of the seventh seal. The one whose right it is, is obviously the true Christ, who returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the seventh trumpet after the hour of temptation. And thou, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach. Even say thou, The sword, the sword is drawn, notice it's there twice, for the slaughter it is furbished, to consume because of the glittering. The consumer stage of the locust army begins upon Satan's appearance in Jerusalem as the false Christ. Remember, this is written to the land of Israel and to Judah and Jerusalem. The Ammonites symbolize the hidden dynasty of politics because Ammon and Moab are symbolic of the two wings of the communist system, and the one world political system has feet like the feet of a bear. To document what I'm saying, go to Amos chapter 2, and you'll see that Moab burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. That's speaking of the Bolshevik Revolution, where Tsar Nicholas II was murdered along with his family, and the Ammonites and the Moabites, prophetically, are symbolic of those two wings of the communist system, the Trotskyites and the Stalinists. And they've even infiltrated the two wings of politics throughout the world to this day. The hidden dynasty of politics, which is controlled by the Kenites, is set up to lead the world into the deception of Antichrist. So when you hear politicians making promises concerning Jerusalem, you better stop and think about who's pulling their strings and who they're associated with. Know who the Kenites are, and it's not a problem to figure out what's really going on in the world. Whilst they see vanity unto thee, that's emptiness, Whilst they divine a lie unto thee, see the deception here in the hidden dynasty of politics that leads up to that first beast, the political beast, once Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven unto the earth. Whilst they see vanity unto thee, whilst they divine a lie unto thee, to bring thee upon the necks of them that are slain, they're leading you into the slaughter is what they're doing. They're going to cause you to be deceived by Antichrist. Of the wicked, whose day is come when their iniquity shall have an end at the seventh trumpet, and ultimately at the great white throne judgment whenever they're blotted out of existence if they don't get their act together during the millennium. Shall I cause it to return into his sheath, the sword that is to say? Should I call all this off, or should I carry out my perfect plan of salvation, God is asking here? I will judge thee in the place where thou was created, in the land of thy nativity. And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. Remember, Christ returns at the seventh vial. God's in control of all of those vials of the wrath of God. And the sixth vial is when Satan appears as the false Christ. God's in total control of everything. Satan has no pull whatsoever. Think about it. He's cast out of heaven unto the earth. He doesn't have any control over that. And then he appears as the false Christ exactly when God wants him to. He doesn't have any control over that. Then at the seventh trumpet, whenever the true Christ returns, he's locked up in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Does that sound like he has any pull or authority whatsoever? No. It's God's plan. It's God's test. It is a trial. It is the hour of temptation. God is testing his children to see who loves him and who does not. It's as simple as that. It's because of what happened in the first world age when a third followed Satan. And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. And he's not speaking to you if you love him and stay in his word and want to know the truth and do your best to hearken diligently unto his voice. He's talking to those who don't care about his word. And if you don't care about his word, then you must not love him. Common sense, isn't it? And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of brutish men and skillful to destroy Satan and his locust army, that is to say. Thou shalt be fuel to the fire. Thy blood shall be in the midst of the land. Thou shalt be no more remembered. If you're blotted out in the lake of fire, you'll be no more remembered by anybody. 
For I, the Lord, have spoken it. But it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all come to repentance and go into the eternity, the third world age. That's how we got in this situation in the first place, because of what happened in the first world age when Satan first rebelled. That's what this flesh age is all about. It's a time of salvation, and the thousand years are a time of salvation as well. That's the purpose of it, to stop as many as possible from being blotted out of existence in that lake of fire. So there you have it, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 21.